So what is convolution? Well, fundamentally, it's an operation that takes two functions or two signals and produces a third one. And it does it in a particular way. So let's look into it here. Let's take these two signals. Here's a signal which is zero before time equals zero and then ramps up and then dies down. And let's to call that time one, for example. And here's another which is zero for all time except a spike at time equals zero. And we're going to see what the output is going to be from a convolution uh, of these two signals. So uh, it often helps to think of this as the what we call the impulse response of a linear system, and this is the input. Now think of the think of a system, imagine that. This is the response of that system, the output of that system, if you put a spike of energy, a short spike of energy into that system. Maybe it ramps up its output and then its output dies down. Think of it in that way for this example. Well, if that was the case, then when we put this input into this system, you're going to get this output, uh, exactly the impulse response. Uh, now, what happens if we put a second impulse. So let's say we put a second impulse into our system. Well, if this is the case, and we're going to put it in at time equals one. Uh, so if this is a linear system, again, then the uh, what happens is, and if it's time invariant, so we call this a linear time invariant system, LTI system, then when we put a second impulse into our system, this response is going to happen, but it's going to start after the impulse. So here it is here, and uh, because it's time invariant, the response at a later time is the same as the response from the earlier time. So we're going to get this. If we had another impulse that we put into our system at time equals two, then we would get another response and so on. Uh, so this is the output, yt, of a linear time invariant system. If these are the inputs, and this is the impulse response. I think uh, that uh, that's intuitive that this would be the output. Okay, what if we decided to put the input at a, a different times instead of naught, one, and two? Maybe we put them closer together. So if we put our inputs now uh, at, uh, let me draw it under here. Uh, let me say that we had our inputs now. So this is a pair. Uh, here. I'm going to draw them so that those two are a pair. This is the input into our system that gives this as the output. So if we had now an input at 0, a half, and 1 instead of one, 0, 1, and 2, 0, a half, and 1, then what would the output be? Well, the output now would be, uh, it, because it's linear, they're going to add and it would be the same effect as here, except they'd now be closer together. So now we'd have one output coming uh, at this time. I'm just going to draw the components here, a uh, second component here, and a third component here. And so now because they're linear, so if, it, if we're looking at a linear system, they're going to add up. So the overall effect will be the addition of these three components, and we'd be getting this and then a straight line across here, because as that goes down, this goes up. A straight line across here, as that goes down, this goes up. And then we'd be going down again. So the overall function, output of our system, if we had this system with this impulse response, uh, then the output of our system here, if this was the input, would be this function here. Okay, now this, uh, let me write down the components uh, of this system here. So what is this waveform here? This waveform here is x naught times h of t. That's what that triangle there is. And then this triangle we're going to be adding because they're adding its linear time invariant plus the second triangle which is x of 1 so it's the height of x at time 1 multiplied by this impulse response. Uh, so that's h of, it's, th it's this impulse response, but shifted in time by 1. So it's t minus 1. Plus this one here, which is uh, x at time 2, times h of t minus 2. 
Okay, so these are the three components from three delta function inputs gives us this result, which is this in mathematics. Okay, now here we can see we've got exactly the same, uh, except they're closer together, so they're overlapping in the output, but there's still the same uh, aspect. You've still got three components here that are adding. It's just that instead of it being at naught, one, and two, they're now at naught, half, and one. And so this would be t minus a half, and this would be t minus one. So this gives us a general function if we had our delta functions if we had an infinite number of them. And I'm going to now think of that. So let's think of general convolution, not just from delta function inputs, but any two signals. So let me look at an input signal. So this is still, we're still going to consider this for our input function here, for our, sorry, for our impulse response here. But now let's look at a signal uh, which might look like this, for example. Okay, so if this was our input signal, so let's, uh, let's just say we're going to X and Y, let's call this ZT. So let's say we're going to put ZT into our system now. Uh, so this is our system and we're going to put a signal into that system if it's a linear time invariant system. One way to think about this is to think about this as being made up of an infinite number of delta functions infinitely close together. And that's the way I think about uh, all of the functions actually, if I'm thinking about linear time invariant functions. So let's think there's an infinite number of delta functions infinitely close together. So we are going to get a response which is going to be one of these triangles for each of these delta functions, just exactly as we had one for each of the delta functions here and one for each of the delta functions here in our output. So now we've got an infinite number of them. Because there's an infinite, we're going to have to scale the amplitude. Let's not worry about that too much now, but just in concept, they're going to be infinitely close together. And then for each one of them, we're going to get this output response. And they're going to change in height because as this changes in height, these output response uh, triangles will change in height. And I'm trying to match them with the height above. Uh, they're responding from that height is going to be responsive to the triangle that comes next. So they're starting to get bigger now uh, here. And they're all adding together to give the overall output which is the addition of all of these components here. When you add up those triangles there, you get a value up here. Add up all those triangles, you get a value here. Okay, so this is going to be, let's call that WT. So this is WT is the output of our system when we have an input ZT convolved with the impulse response HT. And the general equation here, we can just see a generalization of this equation here. Now there's an infinite number here. So instead of a pluses of individual terms, we're going to have an integral, which is also an addition, but it's a, a things finitely close together, of x of tor uh, h of t minus tor, and integrated over tor. So that's the generalization of this expression when you have them infinitely close together. So this is convolution as applied to signals and systems for a linear time invariant system. Uh, if you want more information on this equation, you can check out the video in the link below, which explains this equation in more detail. Convolution doesn't just happen for linear time invariant systems, though. As I said, it's a general operation that takes two waveforms, two functions, and produces a third according to this equation here. Okay, so where I want to give you one other example of where it comes up. And this is a common example in uh, digital communication systems. So let's consider, so as I say, it's not just linear time invariant systems. So let's look at another example. And in this example, we're going to consider digital communications. So let's consider digital communication system where the output signal uh, of a digital data bit, let's just, I'm just going to use the capitals here, uh, these uh, is that these are random numbers now, equals the input plus noise. So this is what happens in a digital communication system. Okay, so the input X is either plus or minus one in a binary digital communication system, and noise is typically Gaussian noise. And again, there's a link to a video below which talks about 
Gaussian noise and white Gaussian noise in communication systems. But let's look at these two x and n and I want to look at the probability density function. So in the case of x, uh, because it's random plus and minus ones, if this is the probability density function pdf for x, uh, then for, for values of x, it only takes, this is the values of x here, and this is the probability of getting that value, then x can only take the values in a binary system, let's say for example that it's either plus or minus one. Okay, so this is the way we draw the pdf for this, is it's it's a delta, it's two delta functions, one at plus one and one at minus one. And there's no, there's zero in between these delta functions because the only possibilities for the value of x in our digital system is plus one or minus one to represent a digital one or a zero. So this is the input to our system, a one or a zero in binary digital communications. And then noise is added. Let's draw the PDF for the noise, the probability density function for the noise. So this one for the noise, so this is the PDF of noise. So, so again, that's a half because there's a half probability, half chance of wanting to send a one and half chance of wanting to send a zero. Uh, you never know what the data is you're going to be wanting to send until you've measured the signal or recorded my voice and digitized it or whatever. So there's a half chance. Uh, and okay, so let's look at the noise. And typically, as explained in those other videos, the noise has a Gaussian probability density function. What that means is there's the, it's quite, this is the probability of getting this value of noise. So what it says is there's a small probability that you will get a big value of noise either positive or negative, a small probability, but there's a bigger probability of getting a small value of noise. So the noise typically isn't too big. Sometimes, very rarely, it's very big, either positive or negative. Mostly it's around zero and it has this Gaussian shape. Okay, so where does, why am I telling you about this for convolution? Well, it turns out the, the PDF of Y is the convolution of these two PDFs. So if you have two random variables and you add them together, if they're independent random variables, then if you add them together, so I'm gonna write independent up here. So if they're independent random variables and you add them together, then the probability density function of the result is the convolution of the two probability density functions. So this is another place where convolution comes up. So let's look at that uh, function here. What have we? What's that going to look like? Uh, well, uh, we're going to have uh, the values of y that we can take and the PDF of y here, uh, of y, capital Y, the random variable capital Y. Well, when you do the convolution of a function with a delta function, it takes that function and it puts the zero of that function over the top of the delta function. We actually saw that over here. See this function over here, when we did a convolution of this triangle with the delta function, it took the zero from this function, which was here, the start of the triangle, and placed it at the location of the delta function. So this triangle moved so that the zero part was placed at the location of that, that's this one. And then again, at the location of that, the zero was placed here, that's that triangle. And so it's a general property of convolution. And so here we take the convolution of these two, we're going to take this, this Gaussian shape is going to be located over this delta function and this delta function. And of course they're added together, just as these were added together and they were added together uh, down here because it's linear and added together here, the same thing happens now in the PDF space. So this is minus one and plus one. And so the overall probability density function for the output of a digital communication system when you have binary inputs looks like this. So there's an equal chance of getting a plus one and an equal chance of getting a minus one. And the area under this curve is the probability. So the area under this is the probability of getting a plus one. And the area on this side is the probability of getting a minus one. 
because uh, you're adding up all the probability for values which you would detect to be plus one and all the probability for values you would detect to be minus one. This is a symmetric function. It's come about because of the convolution of the two. And I think you can see you would expect to get plus ones, but never exactly because of noise. So you get them close to there. Very rarely, so low probability, you're going to get a very high value. Uh, a very low probability, you'll get a very large negative value. Uh, small probability, you'll get something on the border of zero, where you couldn't really tell if it's a plus one or a minus one, um, but mostly you're going to get values around the plus one and the minus one because of the noise. So this is another example where convolution arises. It's not just in linear time invariant systems for the inputs and outputs of a system. It also arises when you add random variables and you see the output of the probability density function as a is a convolution of the two inputs. So if this video helped you, don't forget to like the video. It helps others to find it. Uh, subscribe to the channel for more videos and check out the web page on the link.